and you're here with us in the Gunners Club, and you're here with Gunner and with Emin. Good to talk to you. Hey. We're talking about AI. The bitch is running wild. What do you think? Oh, let's get it. <laughs> All right. You know what I was thinking about? We went to see uh, the E3 gaming conference That's a few right. years ago in Melbourne. One of the last, I think. And we saw an argument there between some Japanese developers. One was a virtual reality developer and the other one augmented. And the panel were asked, which one is more resource intensive? And what was the consensus? There was no consensus. Both argued, one was on the fly, that you're not in a controlled environment. So to have your hollow lenses mm -hmm. would actually require more um, resources. The other said, no, no, you want a, a perfectly controlled environment, so you need sensors ahoy. I think the problem is that the whole controlled environment will be the whole planet Earth. And that's what we're facing. Gosh, I think you're right. And let's not forget when it comes to resources, for every 60 questions you're asking your chatbot, that's one litre of drinkable water. Now let's think about the context of things. For the last 300,000 years, what's between our ears is what's been running the planet. Basically, we thought of ourselves as God-given apex people of this earth. And we were the embodiment of consciousness and creativity for all of civilization. But now we find in our pockets a co-pilot, um, something which we can refer to at the drop of a hat, and that's AI. Now, how do you, as a computer programmer, understand AI? AI started from machine learning, and that's basically, can you categorize, mm -hmm. or can the machine categorize for itself? So, typical thing was flybys, they wanted to analyze data, and they wanted permission to do it. So, if you opted in, you were part of their campaign, okay. right? And they could actually get computers to analyze just correlations like nappies and beer. They don't often sell well, do they? No. Except if it's a Sunday or Saturday night when the poor dad sent to get them, then they might. I get that. So dad's bought the nappies for the kid and he's rewarded himself with a beer. Sure. Now, Why not? With the time stamp and, and the um, receipt, the computer can find these relationships. But other things are a little bit more, you need someone to actually be the final arbiter. So, for instance, you send away some cells to get analysed and you record the laboratory, the, um, a few things about how quickly the cells grow, mm -hmm. the medium it was grown in. And at the end, someone will actually have to teach the machine this was a positive cancer cell or was negative. So it's called supervised. You actually have to say it belongs to a success or a failure, a positive result, a negative result. That was the most simple way. Okay. But now we have the generative AI, and I understand it's actually got the creativity to find relationships and to work towards its optimal goal. Is that correct? Yep. Now, it's easier, first of all, to start off with just simple static information rather than words. Okay. So just imagine if you had a language, English, and you wrote down all the words and you put them to the nearest related words. Mm-hmm like child, then family, father, etc. put them together. Yeah. And you did the same with Greek. Mm -hmm. And you put one template on top of the other, and then you put your finger on the word child. Yeah. You'd pretty much likely come to the word child in Greek as well. Sure. So that was a really good way of saying there must be some one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, that's kind of similar to the philosopher Wittgenstein from the Austro-Hungarian Empire who decided that words themselves have no meaning but it's the context in which you find them. And similarly, when we try to define the essence of something, we try to put it into a context. So I understand in the world of AI, there was basically a technical freeze for about 10 to 15 years where they just couldn't get it to identify certain sorts of things. So for example, according to Wittgenstein, if you want to teach a computer what a cat is, you want to show it a picture of a cat in repose, a cat stretching, a cat licking its paws, uh, and that way you're grouping it together rather than a, basically a platonic thing where you say this is the actual value of sure. something. Now, I remember asking you a question and saying to you, what have you been up to today? And you said, I've been trying to teach my computer the difference between a chihuahua dog and a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell me about that? If you see a baked tray of muffins with raisins in them. That's right, it was muffins. Yep. If you actually skew the muffins a little bit, they can look like an adoring chihuahua beaming at you. Now, again, that's supervised learning. Um, so let's go back to, for instance, what a hand can be. A hand for a computer is something that does, something that is, and um, something that has a function. So it's a little bit beyond just 
identifying something in poses itself because when you actually try to fold it back get an artificial photo to be created it has to be cognizant of all these things mm -hmm. now the advances started happening when neural networks started to get modeled and that's really looking at the way the human brain actually branches from with a number of, of um, dendrites from one cell to multiple cells and in turn making a path now once you've got that each each path is strengthened according to a, just a few stimulus two or three stimulus a positive on and off or an intermediary for instance mm -hmm. now having multi levels of how many neurons it goes deep can easily be replicated in machine learning now it's got to the stage now where with a credit card i can actually use for instance SageMaker on amazon which is the e-trading company but also has industrial computer power yes. i can actually use machines that are actually made best for this processing so it's affordable it's very very affordable and that's where we've started to get our breakthroughs now here's the concern i have about ai and the bitch running wild we are not aware fully of the data which is available for ai because let's face it it's been given pretty much an open slather to the internet and an amazing array of human text um, secondly we have no understanding as to whether it does or can perceive itself and thirdly we have no idea of the decision making process it goes through to justify the decision which it finally makes so i remember when i was in school and even if you didn't do very well and the teacher was trying to give you extra points he'd say just make sure you show you're working i'm sure it does but it, you're not going to get the information ah well that's a bit of an issue you, so, you just assume just as in any other company or industry mm -hmm. that in a globalized world that while you're asleep, someone in the third world is bargaining for your job at a cheaper rate. And as the head of Australia, Infosys said when I was working for them, mate, anything that can get sent over a te telephone line is up for grabs. So it's, don't think that the, the resources are going to be in your favour because of AI. So this seems to me to be a large problem because at the moment we do not require AI companies to have a standard of auditing or certification. That means it's completely opaque, the decision-making process that they go through, the data that they use, and for us to understand the final decision which is made. Now, let's remember that the purposes are basically written into the code as to what it is they're trying to achieve. They're done by companies whose ultimate goal is to make profit and who ultimately have a number of subscribers larger than some continents even have as population. That to me worries me. I'm slightly reassured to know that the Australian government recently has released a code of standards uh, when it relates to the use of AI in schools and that at least goes through some modicum of trying to understand what the security of the data is, what the outcomes are supposed to be and some sort of surety with that. Um, but do you think do you think ultimately that AI at the moment is or will be in time sentient? I think it's in a perfect position to become because it can become perfectly independent. I'm going to be sitting a, another Amazon qualification this month in which one of my problems is how I can lock down people's resources so that no one can come in and start doing crypto coin mining with my resources. Now, if any AI wanted to sustain its own energy and be self-funding, that's what it would do. It would just squat on resources. Mm -hmm. And it can, can, just like water will find the lowest level, it can just keep chipping away and chipping away and finding a little resource here, a little thing to, to take there. When I, when I look at AI, sometimes I'm amazed that it can write its own code and better than me and quicker. And, and, and you've used that, haven't you, in many yes. examples? Yes. But a lot of the time I look at it and just write natural text and I don't actually see that glint in the animal's eye of intelligence looking back to me. And that's similar to really what Turin was talking about when he came up with the imitation game, that test of it's basically saying that we will never be able to understand what goes on in another person's mind, let alone that of an animal, or in this case, AI. How can we actually provide some sort of a test to know, in fact, if it is sentient? And basically for him it was, well, if it could basically imitate or mimic something which was conscious, he would basically give it the benefit of the I, doubt. I, I see, what's a real problem to me? It's just like they say that demons are, are born baked in with an enormous amount of knowledge. 
that AI is, is almost has all the free um, resources on the internet baked in as its knowledge too. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's stolen with web scraping. Um, and that it knows the patterns and it knows every pathway through every pattern. Not every, but you understand what I mean. Um, and eventually you just have to say it's going to become its own order of thing. And as I've heard um, someone say, it's going to be like its own order of life and it's going to be a companion. I mean, as a statistician, the idea of a, a demon would be something which would have absolute knowledge until an infinitesimally small period of time. And because it had that knowledge, including projection or volition of something, would be able to predict almost flawlessly what the next action, in fact, would be. Yeah. I mean, I know that our philosophy has changed a lot um, with Heisenberg and trying to understand it well. If you understand the motion, you don't know the position or, or vice versa. And so philosophy's changed a lot in that point. I was thinking a lot about the guy, Lemoyne, who worked with the Google chatbot, who basically came up with his own decision that this was a sentient being that he was dealing with, something with a sentience of, say, a 15 to 16-year-old person. And he made that conclusion by saying that he was able to make this program anxious and that really suggested to him that there was some form of consciousness. Even went so far as he managed to get it to suggest a religion, in fact, that he should convert to. Now, I know that he did have a religious background, in fact, um, some sort of a, a priest, but I find that to be quite interesting. Chatbots, in fact, can be corrupted. Um, around 2016, a chatbot was put up there on the market called Tay. Uh, it learned very quickly through humans the notion of hate speech and started to spout hate speech and was taken down 16 hours later, was put back up and then was put back down no. again. Yes, in fact. And, dear viewers, it's probably because of AI that you, in fact, have come to see us today. So since 2015, Google has taken away a lot of the handwritten, human-written algorithms uh, which will bring you here to us. And in fact, that's dictated now by AI. What do you say to that? You see that happening more and more? I was, I was worried during Xbox One when they came out with a Kinect and the Kinect could actually read your heartbeat. Yes. And the question was, well, is the game playing you or are you playing the game? Now, I don't, if it was orchestrated really well, I wouldn't mind. I mean, as I say, most of medical... Um, money is actually spent the last six weeks of someone's life when they just go Pal palliate me, <laughs> palliate me. <laughs> well if AI is not going to make me any richer and, and let's face it it's um, the people who live to 95 and 100 in perfect health are not the general working person, they're the celebrities and the world leaders a well, and in the next 15 to 20 years they expect from a base of one today for AI to increase in magnitude by a factor of one million is this the rise of the machines? What does it mean for you? For me, working in accounting legal services, it means the end probably for about 25% of jobs. And to a large extent, we're outsourcing a lot of these jobs to the third world. That, I see, is going to affect the third world even more heavily than the first world. How about as a computer programmer? It's already being felt. Um, in fact, to the point where I'm looking another career and, and urgently. It's, it's not a... It doesn't matter how much I learn, a computer will never tire. Um, and for something that doesn't have a time anxiety to it, because waiting a microsecond for it is an infinity anyway, what's it matter if it has to wait a day for a person to reply? Um, but with a person, does I can never upskill. Uh, I can't keep pace. It's off the chain. I, I can't chase it. The, the, I can never spend enough money on education. I can get, never get enough digital certificates. It doesn't matter what I do. It does even things like oh, you know, use a blockchain so that when you put up your your certifications online, no one can squat on your credentials. I see immense changes happening. I've seen some things issued by governments where they're suggesting ways that you can actually be more creative and make money out of this transition. For example, changing from um, being a clerk at a store to a childminder. They're not necessarily transferable skills. Or some other things from working in a warehouse to perhaps being a teacher. I mean, it's, These skills are not the same thing. Is the whole world eventually going to be everyone knocking on doors and having an are you okay day every single day? Because that's what it's going to be. You know, I mean, well, It's not the people who are writing music. It's the people who are working as jailers and the computers who are deciding to... Well, know. let me tell you something. When I grew up, 
the idea was that I would get to enjoy my retirement, which you know I'm looking forward to the next decade and a half, and I'll be able to compose poetry and music. But the way I see things at the moment for AI, it's me who's going to be bowing and welcoming people into Kmart, and it's going to be the computers enjoying making music and poetry and poetry and making art and and enjoying good health. Good health to you viewers. Good health to you. We'll see you on the next adventure. <laughs>